ado, our third panel will cover social media and our relationship with technology. Their focus question is intense, and so here it goes. Social media may have redefined what it means to quote unquote, a sense of community, but is the combination of overuse and the need for validation and attention destructive to mental wellness, as well as distracting and detrimental to productivity? Our moderator for this panel is Travis Basso, librarian and college archivist. Welcome, Travis. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here today as we speak about uh, social media and its impact here. Um, uh, I just want to open with a quote here. So social media is something obviously we all are familiar with, we all use on varying levels, and it affects our daily life in many, many different ways. Um, so many different important issues surrounding it, privacy, uh, social communities, uh, false information, and, and the list goes on. Just yesterday, uh, Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, uh, tweeted this out after giving a presentation. He said that technology is capable of doing great things, but it doesn't want to do great things. It doesn't want anything. That part takes all of us. That's why we're here, right? We are optimistic about technology's awesome potential for good, but we know that it won't happen on its own. We're going to crack into some of these issues here and hopefully uh, hear from you all because most of us in this room, especially those of us uh, enrolled in college right now, are using social media all the time, every day, in different capabilities and capacities. So we're very uh, keen to hear what you have to say about that. Um, our special guest speaker here, Pamela, Pamela Pavlishak, yes? Pamela here, thank you. Is a, Pamela is a futurist who consults, speaks, and writes about our emotional, tech, uh, emotional connection with technology. Uh, she's informed by her deep interest on conflicted emotional relationships with technology. Her work is part deep dive research, data science, and part design. As a researcher, she creates experiments that challenges us to see technology and ourselves in new ways. Whether documenting new internet emotions or asking people to confront their digital alter egos, Pamela's work is aimed at understanding how technology can help us actually be human. Pamela teaches future designers about the emotional side of technology at Pratt Institute in New York City. She speaks about emotional side of technology at tech conferences, including TNW, Web Summit, and South, and South by Southwest, uh, as well as universities such as Stanford, ASU Center for Science and Imagination, and uh, organizations including Google, Facebook, and 3DS. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, NPR, Slate, CBC, and Quartz, among others. Um, Pamela, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Thanks also, for having me. Thank you. Also joining us today, we have uh, our STEAM faculty member here, Joan Adams, in the social work department. Yes. <laughs> Joan Adams is certainly no stranger to the community here, and we're grateful to have her on the panel today yeah. to help us sort of sort through a lot of these sort of emotional, personal, social issues here. We also have the pleasure of being joined by a number of students. The first one here, Haley Mitnick is a, thank you. Haley is a psychology major, so she's gonna help us unpack some of these things. Uh, next on the panel, we have Sarah Khan. Sarah, yep. <laughs> a lot of friends in the audience today. Sarah, also psychology major and a fellow student here at Concordia. And finally, Christian Del Armo. Again, fellow student in interdisciplinary studies in English and history. So hopefully all together, yeah, history sat out there. Uh, we're gonna hopefully unpack this and we look forward to your questions. Um, so now I'm gonna turn to my panelists here, starting with Pamela, and we're gonna see what this is all about. Pamela? Um, sure, so I guess I can open up with just a few thoughts. Um, I think that, you know, if I asked you all about your emotional connection with technology right now. Some of you might be like, hmm, I don't know. But I'll just shout out a couple of platforms and you tell me if you have any associations with it. How about like Instagram? What do you think of? What kind of feelings come to mind when you, when you think about Instagram? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Pictures. Well, that's not a feeling, though. Well, it could be, I guess, for a robot. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. Fake. Yeah. Brutal. <laughs> oh, approval. <laughs> Could be brutal too, probably. <laughs> Maybe envy. Maybe joy. Maybe like there's some feelings we don't even have words for yet. Um, two in the morning, kind of stalking your ex, and uh, you're scrolling, and accidentally, you're kind of sleepy. Thumb taps the photo, right? <laughs> you have to untap it again, like what is that? Or you see the dots on your phone for a text message, there's so many feelings there, right? It's like anticipation, what are they gonna text? If it's taking too long, it's like ugh, annoyance. What about when it just goes away? <laughs> it never comes back, what is that feeling? <laughs> We've all been there, right? So I think that when I'm thinking about social media and all of its, its benefits and woes, to me, even though we talk a lot about attention and the attention problem and how it distracts us from things in our real life, to me, I think it all goes back to emotion and that it's making us feel bad in ways that we don't want to feel bad. And there's probably more negative than good. And the reason behind that, I think, or one of the reasons is that it's the way technology is designed. It's rewarding those moments where we're angry. Um, anger is a really active emotion, and it fuels a lot of our um, you know, responses to anyone else. If we're angry, we're more likely to comment than if, say, we're sad, which is kind of a deactivating emotion. So as designers, even though a lot of people in the tech industry want to do good as individuals, they're also tasked with supporting a business model that says, yeah, we need lots of engagement on these posts so we can show ads. And how do we engage people? Well, we engage people through their emotions. And that has unraveled and led to a lot of things. It's led to mental health impacts, for sure. It's also led to spreading around fake news, <laughs> for instance, right? Um, and all of those kind of um, things that instead of helping people build capacity or understand their emotions better or have in-depth conversation, which certainly social media could be redesigned to do, instead it's been optimized and maximized for these um, kind of, I don't know if you want to call them baser instincts or just human impulses that we have for approval and belonging and um, to express our opinion and those travel through the network. There have been studies about emotional contagion. It happens in person, right? Like right now I'm reading the room, reading a little sleepy, <laughs> a little bit, you know, perking up of interest maybe. And, but like we, we do that all the time and our emotions travel through this room, through your family, through your friends, but it does it on social networks too. And when we're optimizing for those negative emotions, that's when we start to get into trouble. And so I think that, you know, part of my mission is to help people feel a little more empowered. Like, I don't see a lot of the changes in social media happening from the top down. I don't see a big understanding or a big taste or commitment for regulating in the government. I don't see a lot of the big industries. It's kind of against their self-interest. Their interest is to build value for shareholders, not necessarily to protect people's mental health. <laughs> so I don't see it coming from them. I see it coming from the people who are on the ground designing these applications and from you all, from not just how we choose to use it, but from being involved in that design process. That's a big part of design thinking. It's been a huge movement in the last decade, and it's been about reaching out for wide participation in the community when we design things. And so I think there's where I see a little bit of, of hope in social media. But I'll stop there, because I think there's a lot of ideas there, and I want to give everyone else a chance to, to chat. Thank you. Okay. Joan? All right, great. So. <laughs> Thank you. 
wanted to start by saying um, that we all, of course, should recognize that social media is a tool. Social media is not the thing in, in and of itself, even though it's a part of technology and we are all influenced and affected by good and bad by technology. It still is, they are, they are still just tools. Um, and tools don't create problems, necessarily. It's how we use tools. So uh, uh, some of the good uses of uh, social media, in, uh, particularly technology, new technology in general, is that it helps us stay connected to people who, are, who share similar interests. It also helps us meet and stay connected to people who are different from us. So the world is a lot smaller with social media. I've had uh, many conversations about this, and um, recently one 23-year-old student here, undergraduate student here, told me he keeps in touch with friends in, he made and keeps in touch with friends in Sweden. He's never been to Sweden, but he knows what's going on in Sweden because of his social media contacts. Another good thing, it can get the word out about different things. Good and bad, too. And you know about that. If you want to have the party, nobody sends out invitations in snail mail anymore. <laughs> right. It's social media to get the word out. Um, the word gets out, for, as I said, for good and bad reasons. We'll look at some of them uh, in, in a minute. Helps you keep in touch with people. Good. Right. People that you may have lost touch with, um, reconnecting with them, people from school, um, so on. And it's good for um, entertainment, <laughs> good old-fashioned, plain old entertainment. Um, we talk often about the problems of social media. A lot of the conversation stays there, and I have to be careful myself to not sound like the oldest, the oldest, slowest, most behind person too, and want to complain and always banging on about problems of social media. So I've corrected myself, and, and I, know I don't do that. I almost did, but I stopped. Something, <laughs> I used to think all the time when I saw students in class um, uh, with the fingers going, the thumbs going, I used to think they were keeping in touch with friends, like telling people the dumb things I'm saying and asking the friend to help them get out of the class or wondering <laughs> if this woman is ever going to shut up. Um, and then someone told me, a few people told me, but the first one said, you know, we're not always texting people. It's not about chatting. We are keeping in touch with all kinds of things and all kinds of people. So we're using all those times very often when there's a slow moment. Mm, sometimes not so slow from my perspective. But <laughs> th they might think this is a time to get in touch with somebody somewhere in the world, maybe even Sweden. Right. Um, and there are, so go to, so I gave some of the good things. Some of the downsides, we often hear about the problem areas, overuse, overuse of social media. And that can go from degrees. We can overuse anything. And I like to use practical examples when I talk. Those who are in my classes know I'm always talking about everyday ordinary things too. We can overuse anything. When, when fast food became popular, uh, it was like the newest, hottest thing, and people wanted to go to fast food, and it was just almost seemed revolutionary. Wow, what could be tastier than this? And you wanted to eat and drink it all the time. And then the word got out, well, uh, be a little careful. Maybe you shouldn't eat Mickey D's six days a week, <laughs> two and three times a day, right? Like, oh, but it was good, but maybe you can overuse it, so we can overuse just about anything. Um, to the point of addiction or near addiction. So what is addiction? And that word gets tossed about casually sometimes. Oh, people are addicted to cell phones, addi addicted to social media. Addiction is a very serious thing. Addiction means you cannot stop. The use of it, you are using whatever it is to the point where it is interfering with other areas of your life. And most of us are not, even those who are younger than 25, are not addicted to cell phones. They use it a lot. Um, they're able to cut it off. 
maybe not as long as we might like, but they are able to cut it off somewhat. So perhaps overuse, but addiction, I'm very careful with the use of the word addiction. Um, so, overuse <clears throat> up to the point of addiction. Let's look at some things since we're supposed to look at mental health. Um, there's a, there, there is a myth that social media uh, creates depression. It doesn't cause depression, it doesn't create depression, but it can exacerbate the condition in people who suffer from it anyway. So it can make it seem worse, or it can act, actually make it worse, the depression. Um, feeling the need to connect with someone all the time or not being able to connect with someone all the time. And if you are depressed and you're trying to make a connection and it's not working out, that can exacerbate your feelings of depression, of course. Another problem with it, um, loneliness. We think that because you're connected so much that you wouldn't experience loneliness, but you still can experience loneliness. So the good side of staying connected, you don't have to be far away from people you know and people you love. So you could even be an international student and still keep in touch with your family back home. On the other end, on the downside, you can feel lonely if you can't find somebody that you really wanted to be with. And that's something that's been noticed over and over and over. Another problem that doesn't get discussed as much, and there are studies, but there are studies, and I'm always in the literature about things, people are a little more uncomfortable with their own company. Like just being a little bored, like just slow and just, you know, an old word, just sort of chill, like doing nothing, vegging out, kind of. No, we tend not to do that as much. Why would that be a good thing to veg out? Well, well you get accustomed to being in your own company, in your own head. Think what you want to think. Not have something coming in directing what you're thinking or directing what you are reacting to, but just your own, your own sense. Being alone and quiet, too, helps create empathy because you slow down and you're paying attention to someone in the, in the present. Uh, but if you were always connecting with someone who's not in the room with you, you don't pay attention to other people. There's no need, really. The older I get, mm, slowly, and with the help of cosmetics, slower and slower, <laughs> but... <laughs> I often go to doctor's offices in waiting rooms. And I notice nowadays people don't talk in waiting rooms. Mm. Waiting rooms, airport waiting, medical waiting rooms, airport waiting rooms. At no time do you ever just talk, turn and talk to a, a person. Not that you never, but it's not as commonly experienced as it once was. So again, you don't feel the need to connect with anyone that you don't want to connect to. Mm. And being connected is a good thing too, and having control over who you talk to and how you spend your time is mostly a good thing. Notice that very few of us watch television programs that at the time the program is being um, shown, but we record and so on, and record is even an old word, but DVR and all these other things. Right, um, and it's the same thing with, with, with connecting to people. You don't have to, you just have the control of who you talk to and when you talk to them. One or two other points. Um, it can discourage you from connecting to the here and now. I notice when I go to concerts, and I'm a music lover, so I go to a lot of concerts, and um, people are not as focused on right now, but they want to catch it. <laughs> so I see a lot of people looking through the pinhole of, a, of, of the phone to capture it for the future. And it, it, can, it can change what you're experiencing in the now, too. So that's an, that's an, interesting, an interesting point. A wrap up, kind of, because I know I can be long-winded. Um, <clears throat> these things are not accidental. These things that we're, we're talking about and experiencing, as, as Pamela said a moment ago, there are forces that are helping to keep us connected in ways that we might not think about. Just like, back to McDonald's, there's a reason that you eat fast in McDonald's and eat more. You ever look at the straw of a McDonald's, in McDonald's? It's like a, a small tunnel. 
that straw. So you scoop it up, swoop it up fast, and you want more before your body even realizes what's happening. McDonald's are not soft and cozy, and you just want to hang out forever. No, they're, they're hard furniture, bright colors, stimulate, stimulate. There are people who are designing, as Pamela was saying, designing ways to keep you connected, to fire up your dopamine all the time. Um, the feedback that you get, very different from television watching and other things, the, the, the feedback that you get is immediate and seems very personal, but it can almost be addictive because you keep needing to hear, get that response, get that response. It's almost like a, an electronic high. So, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yes, right. And they feed so much off anger, not so much off happiness, but more off anger. Ooh, that's kind of creepy when you really think about it. Gosh. The other thing is that people are following you all the time. So privacy is, is a dead, dead subject. Mm. No privacy anymore. So I remember once talking with my brother and asking to look up something on, on his computer, same time I was looking up. And I said, okay, go to Google, go, go to Google. Put in such and such, put in such and such. He got an entirely different read out, his mm. menu of responses. And I kept saying, how stupid could you be? I told you, put in this, put in that. And we did it about four times and realized, and this is years ago, we all know this now, but we need to keep in touch with it, that people are following you all the time. There's a whole industry built on <laughs> following you and appealing to you, not in a mass sense, but in a very personal sense. So I'll wind up by saying, I like to take control of my life a little bit more than allowing an industry to do it. And I would recommend that we think about how we use our tools. Yeah, so when you come to my office, or if you're in my car, you can't talk with people who, who are not in the, in the car or in the room with us. I find that insulting. I gave a, a, a student a ride um, one day and she was stuck somewhere. And I brought her back to campus. And she was on the, no, 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 no. <laughs> that can't work. You have to connect with me in this time. <laughs> And this time, if you need to notify someone who you are and this teacher is taking you, fine. But after that, we need to communicate. Mm -hmm. So I like to do that. When you come to my office, I, I can't be helping you with something or discussing something, but you're connecting with other people. Let this be between the two of us. So I would recommend that you think about that a little bit too and take back some of the control and not give away all the control to other forces. Wow, thank you, Joan. Thank you. <laughs> Haley? Okay. May 1st, who is this on? You can hear me? Okay. <laughs> May 1st, 2010. This is the date that changed my life. My family friend, someone who helped raise me, someone who I loved, someone who I looked up to as a role model. She killed herself. Then following six years were really tough. Twelve more individuals in my life had resorted to the same decision to end their life. Twelve people. As a grieving teenager, my only escape was to write. So I wrote down how hard it was not to want to give up too. I write about how difficult it is to be consumed by grief. I'd write about how I lost my faith, my anger for the world, and my confusion. Eight years later, and I'm still writing about the grieving process. I share these writings on a Facebook page in memory of my family friend who died. This is the only place that I openly share my writings. I share my writings in order to validate my own feelings, to help others know that I feel similar to how they may be feeling, to share memories and to show support for anyone who is dealing with grief. I have never received more genuine love and support on a social media network than I have on this memorial Facebook page. For me, I use Facebook completely differently than I use social media networks. Sometimes I use it to keep in touch with my relatives or to share inspiring videos, but secretly, I really just use Facebook to see those 13 people in my life that had chose suicide. I can't talk to them, 
can't give them a hug. I can't smell them or give them a call, but I can see pictures of them, and that helps sometimes. I don't usually discuss these emotions as openly on my other social media accounts. There's this unspoken law when it comes to the use of different social media platforms that we all subconsciously abide by. I can't say I've always used social media as a platform for all the things that I believe in. Maybe because we literally have the ability to filter our lives now. To only show the good, we post without even thinking because it looks nice to us and to others. What we don't always take into consideration is how we tend to look for support and validation from others by receiving attention in the form of likes and comments under our Instagram pictures. I'm not proposing that we stop posting pictures where we share happy moments in our lives, but feeding into these perfectly lit, perfectly angled, perfectly too perfect pictures that are being posted, it feels like a waste. There are so many great aspects of social media, like the freedom to express yourself, connecting with friends and family instantly, and educating ourselves about important movements. But often more times than not, I'm drawn to these false expectations of how to look, how to feel, and how to act. I wanna like more photos of motivational quotes about self-love than I do of girls in short dresses and flower crowns on their heads. I want to share my writings without feeling judged. I want to share the important matters in my life, even if it isn't super happy and filtered, because it's so important to talk about things like suicide, depression, body dysmorphia, and even loneliness. I tried searching hashtags on Instagram to see how others may be dealing with mental illness through social media. I searched words like hashtag depression and hashtag self, uh, self help. But instead of bringing me directly to the most recent and popular posts, Instagram not me, notified me that my keywords were alarming and it provided me with a link to a mental health help page. But we still don't talk about aspects of social media like this one. We've grown up in a really weird time. At seven, we had an instant messenger. By 11, we lied about being 13 in order to make a Facebook account. Then we had Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. We haven't grown up similar to any other previous generations. We've always had this secondary, flawless life online. But there are consequences to this. You can't have all good without some bad. Now we have issues like rising suicide rates among young adults, linked to cyberbullying or a lack of personal connections to real people, which can lead to isolation and depression. There are pages that encourage anorexia rather than encouraging healthy life habits. We can slide into someone's DMs as a way of flirting rather than saying hi in person. We tend to talk at people online rather than to them. So how do we function in a world of dysfunction? We can be real. We can be honest and blunt, open, truthful people. Real life is not filtered. We don't get notifications when we're at home thinking about something alarming. Real life doesn't work like that. We need to communicate effectively with one another. We should encourage change in the way we use social media. We absolutely should share posts about going out with our friends, our pets, and our family. But we should also share posts about everything. We should share art, poems, self-love captions, sad songs, happy songs, and everything in between. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. That was very moving. Thank you. Sarah? Wow. That was moving. <laughs> um, I'll get into like mental health disorders. Like social media, it can cause personality changes, abnormalities, cognitive stuff like the neurotransmitters. Yeah, I'll get sciencey. <laughs> um, but as everyone said previously, depression. It's also, I'll bring up this now, it's like the chicken or the egg situation, the cause and effect, what happens first? 
you have depression, so you use social media more and you bring yourself down, or the other way around. <laughs> um, like I said, I'll bring up research. A lot of people have said the more Facebook they use, they're more depressed, they hate their lives, they have le less life satisfaction. I also want to bring a big thing about anxiety. It's about the whole liking and having someone there, that social assurance. We want that, we need, we need that, and we also have a higher anxiety level. So say I post a picture, me and my friends went out. Hashtag, have fun, lit, you know. Um, I'm constantly seeing, oh, who liked my pictures? Haley liked it, Christian liked it, why didn't like Camila like it or something? We have like, we get so anxious. It's like, who's gonna like it? The, like we have 100 likes, 200 likes. It's that's, that's our like assurance. That's how we feel more accepted in a way online, which is so, that's how we see, how we, um, you know, validate ourselves. That's what one of you guys were saying. And it's also about having that power and control, putting on those filters, saying, oh, my life is perfect, even though I'm like crying in my room right now. It's, your life isn't perfect, and that's okay to feel that way. Um, and then we get more anxious when, say, someone posts a bad picture of me, and I'm just like, oh my god, I look like that? Oh my god, <laughs> like. <laughs> um, so that brings up a whole point about anxiety and stuff like that. Another thing when I was so like shocked to see this is uh, it also brings up social media use and anorexia and eating disorder. Um, there's actually, so when you think of pro-ana, pro-ana, what do you think? It sounds pro, it's pro something. You sound, it seems so positive. Think again, because it means pro-anorexia. On Twitter especially, um, people researched how there was pro-anorexia accounts. They, advertise, they promoted anorexia. And that's, so if I'm an anorexic girl and I see these posts, I'll be like, oh, I wanna be like everyone else. I was just so shocked because it was like, if you go on Twitter and see these, this movement, it, they post pictures of like explicit contact of nude photos of like a severely skinny anorexic girls, mostly girls, and it's like challenges. How long can you starve yourself for? Completely shocked, as I was saying. And every day, as researchers were looking at this, so many people were following this, and they were like, and like, promoting and accepting this eating disorder, this mental disorder. And they used things, hashtags, like I was saying, thinspo, thinspiration, bulimia, like it's some kind of good, grand thing. And something about like statistics-wise, 94% of those people were female. And a thing about that, eating disorder, depression female dominated and you know other people not on, on top of anorexia they also had depression so that's oh my gosh those statistics are astounding to me and we're talking about isolation always just being with you yes there's the positive I'll talk about the positives right now it's like my parents they talk to people in Guyana Canada Europe I don't know it's so much, I think it's a bigger way it's a bigger community they're mm -hmm. establishing that social network however it's like, I'm in my room, isolating myself, always checking, oh, what did she post, what did he post? And check the DSM-5. Um, <laughs> there's actually a thing called internet use disorder or internet gaming disorder. And what Joanne Adams was saying about addiction, they're literally addicted. They have, it's literally like a drug. <laughs> because you can have withdrawal systems, like, I'm so antsy, antsy, what's, I'm like, I need my phone, I need my phone. And tolerance, it's like the longer they use it will satisfy them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just like, it's a thing. <laughs> I also wanted to bring up like substance abuse. It's like we see, oh, Haley posted getting drunk with her friends or, you know, it's gonna like promote, maybe I'll drink more. You know, that's kind of like the bad stuff of it. Talking to the positives about social media, like I said, with the social networks. I can connect it to people in Sweden <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, so it can help you. And also with suicide prevention, you know, I looked up on Instagram suicide prevention pages. It provides guidance and support so people, so I wouldn't commit suicide. Fortunately, for some cases, it doesn't 
they'll commit it, and it's just terrible. Um, something about that is like, instead of talking to someone, you know, to Title IX, going to K counselors and mandated reporters, it's, it's, I feel like a screen is separating them. So they have this, this anonymity, so it's like I can talk to this pe person about like these deep feelings that I have, and they'll help me because they went through the same things. And I feel like social media, it's like I feel like I'm being judged. But there are like the positive pages where it's like we will help you, and you know that's the great thing about it. Mm -hmm. And you know YouTube, Pinterest, those are yeah. social media apps. And you like, yeah. like I said, or Facebook, you s promote your songs, write poems, you know stuff like that. Um, so that's pretty my like good and bad of social media and the mental health part. So overall, I feel like you know we have to learn to uh, control ourselves. Haley uses it in such a positive way, but if I'm using it in such, it's just so detrimental that it depends how you use it can be a negative or a positive uh, effect. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Christian. Uh, I just want to make a side note. Um, I think it's beautiful irony that right now, before I'm speaking to you all, my phone is buzzing, 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 <laughs> buzzing. Probably something uh, as banal as a snap streak or Instagram notification or, you know, one of those memes that your friends share with you. Um, but um, I think I want to thank, first of all, for the opportunity to speak today about something that I feel affects all of us, and I'll get into that later on. Um, I refer to social media as Frankenstein's monster, doing some research into it for this panel discussion. Um, if we recall the events of Mary Shelley's novel, um, I read it in 10th grade, so maybe a little fuzzy on it, but um, Frankenstein was his creation by Dr. Frankenstein, and he, he was kind of misunderstood, um, thought of himself as something that a lot of people didn't perceive him as, and then once the villagers started seeing him, immediately rejected him, mm -hmm. thus resulting in him becoming the monster that he truly wasn't on the inside, but because of societal um, opinions and societal bias uh, was perceived as. So social media, like some examples have been mentioned so far, can be beautiful, it can be positive, it can advocate for so many great things, but it's up to the individual to decide how far we take it and whether or not it's going to become these negative, uh, negative outlet for all these other negative attributes. Um, Instagram is probably the biggest culprit of this. Like uh, Sarah was mentioning, you post something. Um, even me, as an example, goes as far as to say on Snapchat to go like my Instagram photo, mm -hmm. which to me I think is kind of ridiculous because I'm one of the biggest hypocrites when it comes to social media because I've always said I would never fall into that trap, that wormhole of social media I think Snapchat, and I've said this multiple times, is the bane of our existence. Well, once I see that hourglass on the street, a little part of my insides just churn, thinking, why does that person want to kill the streak with me? Did I do something? Did I say something wrong? <laughs> and you overthink. And for somebody that has suffered with anxiety and depression and overanalyzing things, it just, once again, exacerbates it to a point in which you just feel like, why am I even putting energy into the app? But you still do it anyway. And then once you see that person send that Snapchat or whatever, there's instant satisfaction, even though you're probably going to wind up with the same issue the next day or the day after that. But you start to notice on those apps that you're looking for gratification and you're looking, you're overanalyzing because you're thinking, well, why does one person or why did my best friend not like this post? Why did this person like this post? Or maybe if there's somebody that you're interested in romantically, they like the post, you might read too much into that thinking, oh, this must be a sign that they want to talk to me. We've lost that human touch, uh, the human connection, in even the realm of relationships where it's like Haley mentioned, sliding into DMs instead of just, I don't know, just saying hi to the person or sparking conversation or looking for some sort of commonality, but that is a physical conversation you have to have. You can't just randomly text a person that you like or randomly send them something. It's just, it's kind of irritating that we've become this society where we simply want to find the human connection through a non-human entity, which is social media. Sure, you can argue all you want that humans created social networks, but you need to use social media and balance it with actual human contact, which I feel is the issue today. And I feel that is what's fueling these anxieties, the depression, the mental health crisis in this country and throughout the world. 
Um, to me, social media, the issues surrounding social media are no longer a generation-specific issue. I don't want to be presumptuous, but I think everybody in this room has used some level or some degree of social media either throughout the day, today, or at some point in the past, or at some point in the future. It affects all of us. So we can't just say, oh, it's teenagers, oh, it's millennials. This is an issue that we all have to work on together, especially since social media and the negative attributes of social media are affecting other realms of life. Look at politics, for example. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, there was attempt assassination attempts on several key political figures, both in and out of office fueled mostly by narratives made on social media by both sides of the political spectrum that are simply untrue, fake news is on the rise, and it's because of these outlets and access to these outlets that we're able to perpetuate these false narratives about a particular candidate or a particular ideology. Um, but not to seem so negative about social media, it can be used for positives. We can use it to get a positive message across. We can use it to bring people together from across the world. Like, I have made two friends over social media, one that lives in South Carolina, we have never met, but we're pretty close, and we became friends over PlayStation chat, playing a game of Call of Duty. Another friend of mine uh, moved, because his parents worked for the UN, moved about eight or, eight or nine years ago to, back to New Delhi, and we still communicate from time to time through Instagram uh, chat. So there are some great aspects to social media but just like the Frankenstein's monster, we don't want to accept the greatness. We always want to try to take something that is seemingly perfect and put some impurities to it. And that's those negative spins on social media that are becoming too much of the focus of the conversation. And we need to all come together because like I said, it's not just one generation that's being affected by it, it's everybody. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Okay, so you've heard a lot of different ideas and opinions here. I would love to open it up to the audience now, especially uh, students. You are basically in the trenches using uh, social media each and every day, so we really want to hear your questions. Uh, we've got microphones floating around, and we've got cards if you don't want to personally ask your question. Um, so refer to Cynthia and Gigi over here. Questions? Yeah, I see one right over there. Gigi, next to you. Um, with social media, like, we just heard like it's like a bad thing with a little bit of good, but honestly, social media is nothing without a person. So it's how you interpret um, interpret social media personally. So I think social media has more good th good to it than bad. And we talked about like we don't have a social touch, but like we always go back to like an older generation. Like it was better back in the day. When we get older, we was like, oh, they have something new. Like it may be artificial intelligence. We're talking yeah. about that, yeah. but it's never going to be perfect. So. This thing with like, we have these negatives that like need to be solved is, I think it's a personal thing. Like you can choose what you want to look at. No one's forcing you to look at any page, this, how you interpret things. And so I don't understand this problem. It's more like a personal problem, not like a societal problem. Mm. I'm gonna be a contrarian uh -huh. and uh, say that we've heard a lot like it's how you use it, it's just a platform, it's neutral. It's actually not. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. optimized for certain behaviors. So there's a very popular book in the design world called Hooked. It's based on behavioral psychology where you start with something negative and then you give a little reward. Not all the time, it's variable, it's erratic, and you keep coming back for that reward. And all of our platforms from YouTube to maybe Pinterest less so, to Snap, to Facebook, are built on that model of design, that hooked model. And there are certain patterns that help reinforce that model. One that we've heard from panelists is called metrification. Hmm. Putting numbers on things that you don't normally have numbers on. So like your number of likes or um, you know, looking for a number of comments or people to respond. Another pattern that goes along with the, this kind of behavioralist model is called the bottomless bowl. The original research at Cornell Food Lab has been discredited now, <laughs> but the idea was that people were, there were four people around a table and two of them, the bowls kept refilling and the other two, they didn't. Guess who ate more soup? 
the people with the bottomless bowls. And we have those patterns designed into our platforms. Endless scroll would be a really good example. Autoplay on Netflix. Design silently scripts our lives in so many ways. If you look around us, everything here has been designed. The way you're facing us is framing our conversation. The way we're you know, walking through campus is framing our experience of each other, of nature, of the world. So it's partially us, but I want to take some of that responsibility off of us in a way, too. I think we need to look to the industry and say, listen, you're designing things to reward time spent on your platform, advertising, um, that kind of engagement. And that brings with it design patterns that script our relationships, our feelings, our ways of being with each other. So I think that's important to just note in this conversation. Wow. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, right here. OK. So um, and this is coming from a psychological standpoint. I feel like as, um, as humans, we've become so addicted to social media and technology that when we lose our phones, that we, we, our adrenaline goes up as if uh, we have lost a child. Uh, just, it, we, our adrenaline has, uh, or studies show that our adrenaline literally is the exact same as, um, I'm trying to think, like the homo neanderthals when they were hunting and stuff. What do you guys think about that? Well, I'll speak as a personal example of that. Um, a couple of years ago, and I rarely curse in public. That's one of the things I try to not to do, especially around younger people. But I was at a, a church carnival, and my phone so happened to fall out of my hand and fall into a puddle. And I remember the variety of curse words that came out of my mouth <laughs> at a church carnival, mind you. Because also there's the monetary aspect to like how expensive these devices are and you start to think for somebody that's you know I was only just a year into my first part-time job. I'm thinking oh my god How am I going to repay get the money to get this new phone insurance? What have you and also how long am I going to be away from social networks? Like how long am I going to be out of touch? Am I going to lose let's say like a snap streak? Am I going to lose text conversations? Are people not going to hit me up because I'm out of the loop and I'm not going to hang out with these people because they think I've disappeared or what have you? So I totally understand what you're saying. All of these hypotheticals just race into your mind that's for something that's seemingly so simplistic. Like, I remember I went to T-Mobile the next day and I upgraded to a new phone and they were very, very, very good with that. But in that moment, it was literally like the end of the world and I did something cursing in a church parking lot carnival <laughs> setting that I thought I would never do before, mm. which shows sometimes maybe social media makes you a little animalistic. But <laughs> just as a personal example, I definitely understand where you're coming from. And it, it's true, and it's unfortunate. Wow. Yeah, I think, um, well, Gartner Group is a, a big you know, tech um, kind of uh, futurist agency. And they predict by 2022 that our phones will know more about our emotions than our family members do, and that's because there's new technology coming out that's gonna detect some aspects of our emotion. But I would counter that that's probably already true. If you look at what's on your phone, it knows a lot about you that you maybe don't share with everyone in your lives. I mean, if I asked you all to unlock your phones and like pass it back to somebody in this room, you'd probably be horrified um, <laughs> because it's like there's a lot of personal stuff on there and <laughs> you, we don't want to do that. And I think to your point, Christian, too, it's like probably the most expensive object we own right. mm -hmm. for many people. And now we've got like thousand dollar iPhones, although that's behaviorally designed too, right? Uh, there's two really expensive iPhones and then there's a cheap one. And what the thinking is, is they want you to buy the one that's sort of like in the middle yeah, of those uh, two. So that's course. a behavioral design principle as well. Excellent, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's also, if you don't mind if I say oh, yeah, yeah, something sure. to add on. It's like a sense of security. My phone has been right here, right next to me. <laughs> if I didn't have it, yep. I'd be a lot more anxious. <laughs> and it's also like, like with Christian, oh my God, if my Good thing I have a nice case as well. It's like, it has, it also has my debit card license. Like, 
by pictures. Do you know your parents' numbers off the top of your head? Like, I do, because, you know. <laughs> okay, okay, so maybe no, your so best friend. <laughs> so it's like, it has to hold so much information. And if we lose that, it's just like, we feel like we lose our life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Question. Oh, sorry. Okay, to that. Questions. Yeah, please. Okay. So I, for the majority of you guys, like you said, it's, majority is worse, but I feel like that's not true. I'm focused more like on the individual because an individual makes a society. So like the societal opinion may not be my opinion. Do you see what I'm saying? So what you're basically saying is that is it an individual problem or is it the maker's problem? Because like I'll just give you a blade. If I give you a porn magazine, I just give it to you. You don't, what you do with that, you can look at it. I didn't, I didn't say read it, you know, I just gave it to you. I may have made it, I may have gave it to you, but what you do with that in your hands is your problem, is your privacy. So like life, you don't filter life. You go down the street, someone yells at you, someone compliments you, you can't control that, you can't block them. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you go on social media like, oh my God, he said something about my butt, block. You can't do that in life. So I think what we're really filtering is on social media, not in life. Um, I like how you are encouraging people to, to be, uh, take this back into their own control and feel empowered, that you don't have to be completely stared by an industry, but let's be aware that giving someone um, something concrete like a, a magazine, like a porn magazine, right? <laughs> You have the power to look or not look, but there's no immediate feedback be, be, beyond the person's immediate reaction to when you're given the magazine. But on social media, as you all know much better than I, that there is long-lasting feedback, continual feedback, and something is being programmed for you based on that feedback. Yeah. So if you did click on and look at some porno for, for a moment, it's being recorded somewhere mm -hmm. and you'll be uh, marketed mm -hmm. later. Yeah. And other kinds of connections are being done based on that. Yeah, and to the gentleman who sa said that, um, who's beside you, who said that um, in a few years, uh, when your generation is the older generation, there'll be new things, new things will have come out. Absolutely. Yeah. Because we're social animals, we'll want to stay in touch. Mm -hmm. and we, but we are constantly being changed. Technology is just not today. It's been going on. When the telephone was invented and became popular, mm -hmm. it cut down on, on visiting. You know that no longer had to go and visit someone physically. Mm -hmm. You could call them up. So things, we are always being changed. But we need to look at how we're being changed and mm -hmm. not say that we're not, yeah. not yeah. give a blind eye to it, because we are being changed. And research will even show how our brains are being rewired based on the technology. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, it's wouldn't it be strange thing. if they, would, they weren't rewired? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, every yeah. technology from the jackered loom to the sailboat <laughs> has changed our perception of reality, of reality and how we yeah. relate to each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, tech also puts us in kind of a time warp, like you were mentioning, mm -hmm. where they, I always think about it this way. So like you, um, let's say you go home for the holidays and you haven't seen your parents for a few months and they remember you like mm. how you <laughs> were a couple months ago. They remember what TV shows you like to watch or what you like to eat, but guess what? You've made new friends. You have new ideas. Mm. You are like way cooler <laughs> than you used to be, but they don't know that. They're kind of like an algorithm, basically. Mm. They're pulling you back to the things you liked before and suggesting more of those. And that's what a lot of our feeds do, whether it's YouTube or, or Facebook, is they say, okay, you liked this, so I'm gonna suggest more of this to you based on that. And it's really hard then to get out of that filter bubble and to grow and to change. And I think we need to think about when we're designing those algorithms, design in more of that human capacity to counter new ideas and build new connections and maybe a little bit of serendipity, which we have in real life, which yeah. we is pretty closely managed in our social media alter ego space. <laughs> Excellent. I think I saw a question down over here. Yes?
some things do go away. Um, my space, <laughs> for instance, right? But a lot of stuff does stay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I would like to just add too. So in in Europe, they st they have what's called the GDPR. Okay, and so they have laws. They've legislated the different uses of data. And one of their points is the right to delete. So the fact that companies have to purge data. You're talking about things not going away. So uh, companies have to purge data and this sort of thing. So perhaps these are conversations we should be having in this country. How do we want to write we laws actually, and legislate? We Please. already are actually. Um, California just passed a law that under 16, mm. um, all of your stuff can be deleted mm. um, if you're in California. So that's already a law. France has a similar mm. law, um, which is different from GDPR. Mm. And so I think that's something that there's a growing awareness of, although you guys are already olds compared to the teenagers and they're using things differently than you already. Um, just from my own research, I can see see that. <laughs> so, yeah. but but yeah, I think that's something that is being thought of that that right to delete. And in Europe, it's for grown-ups too, yeah, yeah. not just kids. I think I saw right over here. Question. Uh, so like you use Frankenstein as an analogy, and you're saying how like people he did not look like the rest of the people, so he was perceived as a monster. So I guess my question to you would be, do you think um, Instagram, Snapchat, like every social media, is providing guidelines and setting standards for a perfect person today in society? I think it's influencing what people perceive as the perfect person. Uh, mm -hmm. Just as an example, Snapchat filters, um, you have your typical dog ear filter, you have the crown filter and stuff like that, and I noticed that a lot of people tend to use those filters. They sort of gravitate towards those filters. And if you just comb through Instagram, like the explore option, you notice a lot of people kind of use different apps to make one photo for a different app. So like for an Instagram photo, you're using a Snapchat filter, but then you're putting it through Snapseed to put other filters on top of it and do other edits to it. So it's fascinating how much we put into just one picture that has the capability of being deleted or whatnot. Instagram now has this archive option where you can kind of like hide the photo and then bring it back to your, your feed anytime you want, um, which is fascinating to me. Why don't you just delete it altogether if you're still so unsure about it now? What's six months along the line, you're gonna all of a sudden like the photo. But um, <laughs> there's a perception that these apps are putting into and it's also kind of polarizing people and polarizing friendships I've noticed. Um, I had a photo up with a friend of mine from like, for like a year or so and then all of a sudden she told me to delete it. And I'm thinking, well, why, why all of a sudden now? It's been like a year, year and a half later, all of a sudden you don't like it? Like what if I like the way I look in the photo? So you start to have that disparity and once again it goes back to your point of perception. And these apps are honestly, when they come up with these updates, they come up with new filters, they come up with new features, they're having people like guinea pigs gravitate towards these new features and then the old features become uh, less liked by the person and then the perception starts to develop but not in a good way. It starts to make you go down this wormhole of all these new features and stuff like that. So um, perfection doesn't exist but these social media apps are definitely enabling us to come up with this uh, enigma of perfection. Yeah. Mm. I would like to add to that. Yeah, please. Um, I was just talking to my mom yesterday about social media and filters, and we looked up statistics on um, surgical enhancements, things like that. Mm. So plastic surgery is actually in, is increasing more and more every year now, and people are going in and saying, I want to look like my Snapchat filter. Wow. And that is a bit of an extreme, and I thought no one would ever do that, no one would ever say that. 
But as a nanny and as um, an adult who tries to be a good role model for young girls, the young girl that I nanny, she says, how come you look prettier on Instagram than you do in person? <laughs> and I didn't take that as an insult. I took that as a, you know, you're right. You're right, I filtered this. And I don't want to look like that. I don't want her to say things like that to me, not because it makes me feel bad, but because I want her to understand that you're beautiful in person, you're beautiful in pictures, you're beautiful when you feel sad, when you feel happy, and everything. And I don't want her to grow up thinking, I wish I looked like that. Um, so I think that has a, a big influence on, on who we are today and what we want to look like and the makeup we wear and the clothes we put on and the brands that we have and how much money we spend. And it, it influences all these things that we don't think about consciously. And um, we need to start thinking about that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, seriously. Um, so I just want to say two things. Uh, the first one is social, me social media, the problems it brought up, some of them are not new at all. Um, I saw recently there was a, like an old Vogue magazine from the last century. And um, first of all, they started like photoshopping the pictures of the model on the magazines a long, long time ago. And the filters and everything we see right now is nothing new. And people want to look pretty, and pretty stuff sells better, and this is just how marketing works, I guess. Mm -hmm. And on that Vogue magazine, there was also a diet that was like, eat a, an egg a day and stuff like that. It was like some <laughs> ridiculous stuff that always existed in the world, yeah. always happened. Mm -hmm. And um, the second thing I wanted to say, like, uh, <laughs> people with their feedback and stuff, like, people should learn how to think for themselves better. And I think it sounds like very simple, but it's very hard to do. And people get a lot of feedback when they choose to post things and they should read or not read, they choose for themselves. But the thing is there that they should understand that not everything that's written there is true. And even though people say that, they, they might think it in person, but just not say it. And social media provides a platform for them to actually express their opinions. And if it's not expressed, it doesn't mean it's not there. So if there was no social media, people still would think that, but they would not say it. And you just get a chance to actually see what people like think. Mm. And in that sense, like you should think for yourself what you should accept and what you should not accept. Like, Kind of use this critical thinking and just know that people judge people have opinions but you have your own head and you're like you're in control of your own life and no one's gonna like no one's work gonna affect it no one is gonna affect you in that way it's just the way you perceive things and if some bad comment changes your perception or causes you depression or anxiety i think there's like a deeper problem than your social media use well, i think that's actually something that can where design can help, and that's being talked about right now, is a way to design in like delays or pauses. They're called speed bumps, is the design pattern that kind of gives you a moment to reflect before you post, because obviously we all have this um, dissociative um, property of social media where you have a screen in between. I mean, that's gonna diminish a bit too as we move to voice. And um, you know, and yeah. other non-screen interfaces, but I, I'm sure design will probably have new ways to mm. keep us engaged too, yeah. so that yeah. we need to push back against. Uh, we've got a couple of write-in questions here. A couple of write-in questions here. So this one I think is just posed to the whole panel here. Uh, do you feel social media has uh, led to some of the recent wave of school shootings? That's well, there's really definitely a network <laughs> effect, um, so I'll, I'll let you all speak to it, but I mean, I just think technically, like, we have um, ideas can spread further and faster and with more force than before, so we can point to the old ways and say, yeah, we humans have always been like this or that, but we also have networks that have, you know, billions of people on them, and, and those effects spread really quickly. Mm -hmm. Right, and that whole idea of the feedback, without using the terms, you are much more familiar with the terms, but the whole idea th that you are responded to, you get feedback when you show interest in a possible shooting or some other kind of violent act, 
it encourages you in a way that you, you didn't, oh, excuse me, that you didn't get before. So, um, yes, I think it has something to do with the increasing mm -hmm. violence. Mm -hmm. Yes, because p people are being responded to and, be, and are being encouraged in a way they weren't encouraged before. It was impossible to encourage so many people in such a short space of time, right. but you can now. So, mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> Yeah, it's like what you were saying before about how, like, if they are on social media, this is like, I don't know any research that's done under it, but it's like they internalize a bad comment and how they mm -hmm. vent out is by school shootings. They want that revenge, which is kind of like a sadistic way of looking at it, mm -hmm. but that's how some people cope in yeah. a sense or don't. Or maybe mm -hmm. this need for interaction and connection with others and you don't have that. Um, in person, so mm -hmm. you go on social media and it doesn't feel nice to have negative things said about you or to read things about other people that maybe put you down. And I also think that it contributes to um, like the ability to buy guns mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. Like it's so easy and mm -hmm. you can go on Instagram and like people have guns on Instagram and they can flaunt it and mm -hmm. um, it's this access to all this content but no contact. Mm -hmm. No contact. Yes. Or the yeah. deep dark web, as you were saying, as she was saying over there. So mm -hmm. it's like access as well. I, I mean, I think another thing that's kind of connected to what you're saying too is that there's not all the platforms use humans to filter a lot yeah. of this stuff, and um, it's really um, giving the humans who have to do that PTSD yeah. to have to look at torturings and killings and all kinds of things that they filter out that we don't ever see that are actually like a little bit beyond our, our filters most of the time, um, but still plenty of it makes it through. And that's one thing that tech hasn't really been able to automate very well without human moderators or maybe they're, I don't know. It's partly a tech problem and it's partly a, you know, a, way to do it efficiently business problem probably too unfortunately i've got another write-in question here and then i'll return back to the microphones here uh, this one specifically for pamela pamela do you have any social media accounts if you do how do you manage them if not why um yeah i'm on all of them all the time so um and and i think i'm like most people i'm trying to manage i change what i do i've been able to keep facebook pretty small to friends and family um until the past year or so and then all of a sudden like you know all kinds of other people sort of creep into there um and that's the weird thing about facebook right it's like flattens out all your relationships like you'll mm -hmm. have your neighbor and your mom and mm -hmm. like your best friend from elementary school <laughs> and like all these random people together could be good but mostly it's kind of weird and then you know <laughs> and, and and right google plus tried to do groups but right. we're all like nah and then they then they exploited all of our information and decided to shut it down oh well um but yeah i have i have all of them and instagram and twitter i love twitter and i think twitter could be really great for certain things but you kind of have to find your group i'm mostly aligned with design twitter and mm -hmm. those are my people um you know it's youtube is the one that i mostly avoid though because i have three daughters and it's pretty much always by the third video you're in something really horrifying mm -hmm. And so that's the one that I try to stay off of. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, I think we have, we have a question here. Oh, would you guys say you use social media more than you did when you were younger? It's like, because my mom and dad, they use social media more than me. Like they're always saying that, I have, they're always like angry at me because I don't like their post. Hmm. And I was like saying, why didn't you like tell everyone where you were? I'm like, because that's kind of creepy. <laughs> that, yeah. I do use it more, yeah. 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 I do use it more, but I still regulate. And I don't have everything. And I don't want a lot of it. Um, I'm, I'm rarely on Facebook because I have ways of contacting and staying in touch with people that I want to stay in touch with. And I'm fine with letting go of people. Um, 
and I don't want the network to grow too wide. Yeah, certain so, networks are really good yeah. for certain things, and others, mm -hmm. like, I don't yeah. know <laughs> contact information for all the fellow parents at my kids' school, but they're all in a Facebook group, and that makes it really, really easy <laughs> to do. But yeah. I don't know. I did an experiment. Maybe you guys want to contribute afterwards a couple years ago where I just collected people's personal mantras about how they manage their own internet use in general, you know, and they came up with stuff like typical stuff, you know, mostly about balance mm -hmm. and things like that, or don't read the bottom half of the internet. That was a favorite <laughs> one. <laughs> That's where all the comments are. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. Maybe you have have some some slogans you use. Questions? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, a question of Pamela. It's a future behavior question, right? Sure. Computers, tablets, smartphones, I would call it the Alexa effect. Yeah. It's, for the next five years, we're going to be moving away from touching and thumbing yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. to vocalization. How is that, going to, that transition going to affect behavior? Oh, yeah, well, I think that's going to affect it in a lot of really interesting ways. Um, you know, it's, it's, we attach to our technology and to objects in general in a few known ways. If it has eyes, if it has a face, if it has a voice, if it has irregular movement, there's been tons of research and studies on that. It doesn't have to be a technology per se. But initial work shows that we bond with technology when there's a voice more and we assign it a personality, we assign it intention. Um, so you may like on the one hand say like, oh, well, there won't be a screen in between, so there won't be that disassociation, but you're actually gonna have like a robot personality in between most likely in a lot of your interactions, and that might be okay in some ways, right? Like kids have teddy bears that they use to scaffold to um, have, you know, uh, various relationships, and we have, you know, relationships with our pets and our plants, um, but it, it's also going to be pretty weird, too, <laughs> I think. Okay, so... <clears throat> Pardon? Um, to some degree, they might not be robots that look humanoid. Um, a lot of the initial robots, like Curry and um, Pepper and stuff like that, don't really look like people. They look like little kids or kind of childlike. Or there's Paro, which is a seal, and that's used in um, nursing homes a lot of times as like a therapy pet, a robot therapy pet. Um, doesn't talk though, because that would be weird for a seal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Although I might actually enjoy that, yeah. but I think with pets we like to narrate them. That's the good thing about pets is mm. they don't talk. So <laughs> yeah. I'm being told we have just a few more minutes for questions here, so I think we have another one. Yes? Um, yes, several of you have touched on the relationship between emotions and social media and how emotions affect you know, behaviors on social media. But you know, it's also said that politics is emotion. And I'm wondering if you can talk more about the politicization of social media. I mean, we call it social media, but you know, could we be calling it political media? Mm -hmm. um, certainly with the election of 2016 in the background, but also you know, just even sort of numbing, pe e either people sort of politically identify through social media, or they avoid politics to such a degree that they aren't developing any sort of civic um, duty. So I'm wondering if you can comment more on politics and social media. Well, I think it's interesting you bring that up because there definitely is a strong connection there. Um, just a few months ago, at the, earlier in the year, Mark Zuckerberg had to testify to Congress about Facebook and its ongoing investigation into how it uh, influenced the 2016 election with uh, Russian interference and what have you. Um, but it was interesting throughout the snippets of that hearing I watched how out of touch that our elected officials are with the influence of social media. Um, Lindsey Graham, for example, was asking questions about um, what is the counterpoint or the competitor to Facebook, like uh, comparing it to like Ford Motor Company and what would the equivalent <laughs> to Ford Motor Company be? And Mark Zuckerberg is sitting there like, he wanted to really say, I don't think you understand what Facebook is, but he was trying to finesse this more um, 
detailed answer about how Facebook is interwoven with these other social media apps and these senators and these representatives weren't clicking with the whole aspect of social media. So I think it's also on part of our elected officials that are to some extent elected because of a social media presence that they understand what's being put out um, on these social media outlets about them and how it influences their base. So it makes me wonder how many of these tweets that these senators or these politicians put out are actually done by them or done by somebody in their office, with the exception of the president himself, who is notoriously on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, but going into that, that shows how much uh, social media has been politicized when the president uses Twitter as the main gateway for his policy, major policy decisions. Um, it's good, bad, or indifferent, whatever opinion you have on that, it shows how much the technological age is, is advancing and how it's influencing, like I mentioned earlier in the discussion, other facets of our life. Um, but social media can be politicized and it can show the good and the bad of the political realm. Um, if you see all this fake news that comes up on your, especially on Facebook, because Facebook has been targeted more so with this, headlines that are not cooperated at all, that are from either left, really left-wing outlets or really right-wing outlets that you look for fact checks and you look for sources and there are none. It's just people that are able to abuse the freedom of social media to put out these negative spins on the opponent because they want to create this negative uh, narrative about them to gain votes. So it's unfortunate that social media, especially with politics, is being used in such a negative way when it can be used in such a positive way to get these candidates' message across, to help with donations and facilitating donations, and especially since younger people are reaching these candidates through social media, like the presidential debates, most of the questions came from a outlet of their choice. It was Facebook questions, Twitter questions, um, Google Plus questions, so it's interesting how it was used for that, but then there's also dangers to politicizing social media, especially with this uh, era of fake news that we're currently undergoing. Thank you, thank you all, thank you the panelists, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. You know, this, this, is an important, this is an important issue, and I know you all have a lot of questions. Um, just, I want to keep in mind too that social media, as much choices that we make, as it is pressure we put on these companies to make better design decisions and Hello? our legislators to make laws as well. Um, and before you all break, and you'll have chances to talk to our panelists after this, Amy has a few uh, closing remarks. Thank you all for being here. Like in reality, not in computer time, because when I was a teenager, we were going through the beginning of social media with instant messenger and chat rooms and all that kind of stuff. And it got my own set of identity to the groups and the, the instant AOL and all that stuff. But like today, I'm proud of who I am. And you can like me, you can hate me on Instagram. I'm not on Instagram, I'm just on Facebook, because I'm like that generation. But um, like, be proud of who you are and have confidence in yourself. And like, people names on the screen, even if you did know them in like fifth grade or something, that the people that really mean a lot are probably like your parents or your siblings, even if you don't get along with them. But find the people that really matter, and one of the main people that matters is always yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you to our panel. And uh, Pamela, as a parting gift, we have a little Concordia mug for you. So thank you. <laughs> I love that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'd also like to thank you all for your attendance and your presence here today, the engagement we had on all of our hot topics, social media, Me Too movement, and our health care. It was a beautiful day. Um, and I want to share just a quick thing here. We hope that you leave here today uh, more informed. But however, that's only half the battle. <laughs> Knowledge leads to choices and more informed decisions, and we encourage you to pay it forward and have conversations with your friends, with your family, with others regarding these topics and all the other topics that are crucial within our society now. 
And also, our final uh, panel discussion uh, focus question is this. Is justice a jeopardy of our time? And what can we do daily to protect human rights? Mm -hmm. Our moderators are very own President Nunes. And it, it will be tonight at 7 PM in the Osiris Gallery. So we please encourage you to attend. We'll see you tonight at 7. Mm -hmm.